Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series on the Success Insight Podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Amy Griesack. Amy is a freelance writer and photographer, specializing in everything from gardening to outdoor recreation and natural history issues, particularly in her beautiful home state of Montana. She is the author of a number of books, and we'll talk to you more about that. But without further delay, Amy, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series on the Success Inside podcast. Thank you so much, Howard. I'm delighted to be here today. Fantastic. And I have to admit, you're in Montana. I've always had this fantasy of sleeping out underneath the stars, and it was always the state of Montana that was on my mind. Definitely want to talk to you about the dark skies, because I know you you have them out there, but really, it's just a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series. And before we kind of get in you know, to the meat of the work that you're doing as a, as a writer, a photographer, and specializing in the great outdoors, can you share a little bit with our audience, a little bit of your background, how you got to this place? Oh, it's been quite the journey. It's it's funny how life takes you on these twists and turns that you would never, ever be able to plan out in your wildest dreams. You know, I, I grew up in Northeastern Ohio and it just never fit. You know, I was never a very good Ohio girl, always gravitating towards the woods and the creek and you know, always muddy, always, always outdoors. And at my earliest chance, I moved to Montana. I was hired over the phone at the Isaac Walton Inn in Essex, Montana, which is on the southern boundary of Glacier National Park and didn't know anybody, but I figured I had a job and a place to live. So I packed up everything and moved out. Was this after high school, after college? I mean, did you say goodbye to the family? I had that journey begin. It was a couple of years after high school or about a year and a half, actually. And I had started at Ohio State University and my intent was wildlife biology and I absolutely hated it. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, Buckeyes, fellow Buckeyes, <laughs> but I needed to get out and around fewer people. And so I kept, I figured if I wanted to work with wolves and some of these apex predators that I needed to be in Montana, I needed to be where they are. And so that's why I had my sights set on Montana. But what was funny is even though I was planning on going to the university out here, when I, I would get the newspaper. So this was back when we had newspapers and that's how you found apartments. I would get the newspaper about a week late and of course everything is gone. So when I saw that advertisement for the Isaac Walton, I figured, okay, there's my foot in the door. And I jumped on it and jumped out. But then when I got out here, instead of going to the university, then I managed to, I met a gentleman who was a cameraman for, North, or for National Geographic. Well, actually, at that time, he was working for Partridge Films and WNET on a program on Glacier. And he needed help packing gear and so I started packing gear and then worked with in the film business for television. Wow. Now, as a uh, urban guy, uh, I guess technically I'm still urban here in Vegas, though I get out to the deserts. What does it mean packing gear? Basically, back then, it was all 16 millimeter. And so it was the camera and lenses and film cans. And eventually I did the sound recording. So it was big, bulky equipment. Versus what we have now. So it was basically being a pack mule. You were the Sherpa. Exactly. Strong back to carry the gear. All right. And uh, did, I noticed from the show notes that you provided, you were in weightlifting as a deadlifter. That Was that before or after being the pack mule or the Sherpa? That was before enduring. Okay. It was when I was on, in Ohio, I won quite a bit. And then when I moved to Montana, I continued training and competing. So it was a good thing to do. That's good. I mean, that, that probably goes very well on the resume, especially when you're applying for a job to pack gear, you know, for these photographers. As you started to get acclimated in Montana, how long were you at the Isaac Walton Inn before you kind of shifted the gears? Just six months, just six months. And then I started working in those film programs, those natural history programs. And then it went 
from one program to the next where you would wrap up a contract and then you would work on obtaining another contract and just go from one program to the next. So it sounds like then you were living from, you know, one tent to the next in a different location. I mean, you're just like constantly running around in the dirt and on the mountains and the streams. Quite a bit. We, I did have, my house was outside of West Glacier in a little town called Corum. And I did build gardens. I built actually, cause, because in between contracts sometimes takes a lot of time. Right. And that's what's difficult sometimes is dealing with entities that aren't in touch with how the natural world works is, you know, you're trying to get something done at a certain amount of time and they don't realize that, you know, babies are born at this period of time and this. So, so it was in between. So I built a lot of gardens at my place, I actually built 220 raised beds out of stone wow. because we, we didn't have topsoil where my gardens were. It was just glacial till. So I pulled the rocks up, built up, and then hauled in 14 dump truck loads of topsoil oh. in between filming projects. So oh when I was home playing in the dirt, then it was out in the field traveling. And it was all North America, which was great. I mean, there are so many beautiful areas in North America that you could spend 10 lifetimes and never see them all. That's definitely the case. I mean, it's you know, living in Mojave, there's there's a website I belong to, and there's always, hey, you should visit this site or this site, and I have no idea where they are, even how to get there. And it's like you really realize out west how big this country is. And as you were beginning to, you know, you kind of had, I don't know, one of them was the side hustle, or maybe they were just two equal jobs. You had the the gardening, you had the video, the photography. When did or did one of these start to kind of play a bigger role in your life. And, you know, cause you're, you're kind of living the ideal life, Montana, fresh air, outdoors, but which one kind of started to take precedent for you? You're right. Both of them were kind of equal for a while, just with time spent, but then the filming shifted and actually it was interesting. It was about 10 years time for both that I ended up, I moved into town and then got out of the filming a bit, the television aspect, just because the nature of the industry was changing. They had switched from the 16 millimeter to video. The pay scales became different. So it was a big upheaval at a certain a certain point in time. And so, you know, once again, with pretty much my whole pattern throughout this 30 plus years out here as an adult is I had to shift gears again. And so I started to shift from the television aspect to writing. And so that was about 10 years in. So I went, went more towards the printed way to communicate and just still photography versus the moving one. When you started the writing, had you always been a writer, you know, having working in high school, the journalism, you know, the, was it the school newspaper? How did that begin to you know, take shape for you? Because you don't, I mean, some people perhaps have a natural ability to write. Others, you know, it takes practice and honing that that skill. How did that come about for you? Well, I, I actually started very early. I was in second grade when I were, was writing my first little books. I would write books on how to train your horse or how to train your dog. And then I would sell them to my classmates for like a nickel. I mean, it wasn't a big enterprise, but I was writing these books and selling them. But I went to a Catholic school and the nuns found out and they busted me and they made me give the money back. Oh, that, <laughs> so, that's not fair. No, but that was even early on. It was always this written word was my way to communicate ideas and, and help teach people on how to do things. And so it, it started out very, very early. When I was in high school, I took a journalism class and I got a D. It was terrible because, and one of the reasons was we traveled a lot with my parents. And so a lot of times I couldn't do the assignments like sport, covering a sporting event or things like that. I just, I was gone. And yeah, so I, I failed miserably in high school journalism, but I just have always loved writing. And actually what started in the mag with the magazines are were my gardens. 
you know, I had these beautiful gardens and, you know, gorgeous mountain backdrop. I mean, they, they were stunning. I was very proud of them. And so I started to send editors photos and a write-up of the gardens, hoping that the magazines would do an article. And after a while, uh, editors from Sunset Magazine or Fine Gardening were saying, well, why don't you write the article and we will pay you for that? Oh, wow. I thought that was fabulous. You know, I find interesting, and I mean, just to go back to your in second grade, first of all, with the nuns, it's not like you were selling loose joints. I mean, no. you, you were selling a book. I know. Oh, my God. And <laughs> what I love about it is, you know, it's things happen. You know, sometimes we can plan a little bit how we want our trajectory to be, but it, it sounds like things just happen, you know, call it providence. I mean, they just you know, timing is, is everything. And so you had this, these writing experiences, you cut, you building these gorgeous gardens. And by the way, you know, we, had, for our listeners, I asked Amy before we started, you know, would you please share, you know, half a dozen pictures of the outdoors so we could share on the, our show notes. So I do want to amend that a little bit, Amy, if you've got a nice shot of one of your gardens, we'd love to have that as well. I'm a very opportunistic podcast host. Is I love to have those pictures. When you started with the garden and you're writing your own work now, did you get very comfortable with that? I mean, what was the reader's reaction to these gardens you were building? Because like you said, you're pulling up rocks and making these raised bed gardens. It's not like just you know digging a hole where there's some topsoil. Well, people loved it. And at that time, I also had a small shop that was open, a retail shop that people came to when I wasn't traveling and would always have a big garden celebration in the summer where by the end there were hundreds of people that would visit. So it was neat that after a couple of years of writing, people would bring the magazines with the articles that I wrote and want me to sign them and want to see those gardens. And so, yeah, that that really made me happy. And it it also made me realize too, though, because so many people came in and they said, oh, I wish I could do this. Or I, you know, they wanted something different in their lives, but they weren't willing to make any changes to achieve that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and I was young at the time. I was in my late 20s. And that just really stuck with me that you just you can't get to that point where you want to make a change, but you're afraid. You know, there's a meme that I cartoon that I see every once in a while on Facebook. And you know, there's a bunch of group of people they're they're standing below kind of like a a podium and everybody's and the the speaker saying, everybody wants change, raise your hand. And who wants to do work for it? And everybody keeps their hands down because you see that a lot in, you know, in the coaching world that that I live in is people want a new career. They, they have, they have a dead end job. Well, what do you want to do about it? And it's unfathomable that they actually have to do some work. Mm -hmm. As you began to have these conversations, it sounds like you went also shifted a little bit of on your career with educating folks how to do the work, how to get the garden that they dreamed about. Did that happen? That's absolutely right. If I saw that need out there that people wanted to know the, how to do these basic things. You know, I, I started gardening when I was 10. So it was very, very early. And so it becomes second nature and you take a lot of things for granted. But then I realized that not everybody takes this for granted and people want that knowledge. And so early on, many of my articles were geared towards the gardening aspect because that's what people needed and really enjoyed those. And, and, and even to this day, I love answering gardening questions. You know, friends ask me all the time and send me photos and the great thing is, is no matter how long I've been doing this, which has been decades, is you always learn something new. So somebody asked me a question and by golly, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to find out because I'm going to learn too. And that's the one of my greatest joys in life. When you are asked these questions, is there kind of a, a question or two that really stand out for you, either because of perhaps the sophistication of it or because the question itself led you on perhaps an exploration for an answer and a discovery for yourself? I'm trying to think of a specific, but along those lines, I guess the one example 
that always comes to me is a friend of mine. Her name's Laura Beth. And anytime Laura Beth asks me a question about insects, it's something completely off the wall that I've never heard about before. So, so in that respect, it's like, I don't know why these things gravitate towards her, but I've discovered more things that can go wrong with a garden because of my friend, Laura Beth. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura Beth. You've done a great service here. Now, I love her. Yeah. Now, as you are working on these articles, now, are you still very, very involved with the, with the gardening or have you started to make a, a more definitive shift towards the, the, the freelance writing and the photography? I have pulled back on the gardening a bit. When we first moved to Great Falls, which has been about 14 years ago, and that was when my first son was born. So I was kind of, you know, clo staying closer to home. But when we moved to Great Falls, we were renting a place and we didn't have a garden. So I ended up connecting with the master gardeners and our extension agent and created the community gardens here in Great Falls. So for several years, I was very totally hands-on, full tilt with the gardens here in town. But since the boys are older, so uh, John, my youngest, is 12 and Samuel is 14, and they can hike pretty much anywhere, that we're, I definitely shifted to more of the outdoors. I still do a lot of gardening, a lot of gardening articles, and still have my gardens here because there's nothing like fresh vegetables right outside your kitchen door. Oh, Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but but boy, we love the summer and we love to be able to get out as much as possible. Let's kind of shift over to that. You know, I love the fact that you're, you know, you've got your two sons you, that you've introduced them to the outdoor lifestyle. And I imagine that you're probably taking them on, on hikes, you know, when they're just barely, you know, I was going to say out of the womb, but you know, there's, okay, I said it. I'm sorry, um, but you probably took them on some hikes very early in life. I would imagine. Oh yes, yeah. That had the front carrier to start, and then the backpack, which is a lifesaver, one of the best pieces of equipment ever. But yep, so we started them early, and it's difficult. It's difficult when the kids are young. It takes a lot of patience. And it's a lot more fun as they get older, especially when we bring friends, because then it's just a blast and you get a group of kids together and they see things that adults never see just because they look at the world differently. They're paying attention to different things. And by golly, if you need to find a frog or a snake, you bring a group of kids. You're going to find it. No doubt. Now, when you go out today, is are you going out because you have an assignment or you're working on a project for which you're the producer or the photographer? How are these excursions happening today? Everything I do always has work at its foundation. And what's fascinating and what's wonderful about what I do is any photo that I take on any day can be used either for a book project that I might be working on or for a future article. There's so many times where I've had to go back through my files and grabbing photos that, you know, even when the boys were little, that I never had this specific article in mind at the time, but it works just perfectly. And so I'm always taking pictures of landscapes and animals and plants and, and always trying to keep that in mind. And, and that's one thing that I absolutely adore about freelance writing is because every time we go out. I have a new idea for an article, something that I want to share with those people who can't be with us that day. It's just, I just absolutely love it. Now, are, are your excursions, are they mostly within the state of Montana or are you venturing out to, you know, sites a little bit farther, a little bit more of a trek? We're still sticking closer to home in Montana, which, you know, of course, to get from one end to the state to the other, you're looking at 10 hours. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. We have we have a pretty big backyard to play in. Yes. And which is terrific. I mean, uh we've spent just a tremendous amount of time in Glacier National Park. Absolutely. That's that's my favorite park overall. And then have gone to Yellowstone a lot. And then but we have the Bob Marshall wilderness, which is one point five million acres, basically outside our backyard, and the prairies. We have, you know, I think Montana has approximately thirty million acres of public land. And so we really have a lot to be able to explore. And that's 
that's what we've been doing. We This year, we haven't gone to Glacier quite as much just because of the busyness factor in the park, as well as they've implemented a ticketing system for going right. to the Sun Road. And so we've just held off a bit. And, you know, in September, once that's no longer in place, then we're going to we're going to go more. And plus this year, we we're really having issues with fires and right. the smoke has been challenging. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we we I was going to go out to Mojave this past weekend to take Milky Way shots and we couldn't even do it because of the smoke from the fires. Oh, no. So I can only imagine. I'm curious. Uh, Glacier, it's a well-known national park. Yellowstone, a well-known national park. Are there and of course they have to be on, you know, if you're an outdoor enthusiast, it, it's definitely, it's got to be a part of the, the proverbial bucket list. But in Montana, are there places like, you know, you, you want to see outside, you want to experience the great outdoors, you don't have to go to Glacier or Yellowstone, you should go. And wh where's that blank? Where should they go? Well, I, I do love the Bob Marshall. I mean, I absolutely, like I said, it's pretty much outside our back door and you just, you can't beat it. It's spectacular. The Beartooth Wilderness, that's another area that's tremendously gorgeous that I really, really want to explore more. I haven't spent enough time there. And honestly, if you want extremely rugged country, go to the Missouri Breaks, the upper Missouri Breaks and the Charlie Russell National Monument. It is out east more, and it is just absolutely remote, rugged country. Oh, wow. Now, when you go out and with your boys, I imagine they're up for just about anything. You yell in a nice way, hey, guys, we're, you want to go wherever here is? They're probably, okay, when are we going? Or, you know, can we cut school perhaps? Uh, what's What's it like, you know, taking the boys out? How do they feel like, you know, we're going to go help mom do her work? They're, they're actually great troopers overall. My youngest, uh, a few years ago, he wasn't so keen on the whole concept. And so it wasn't quite as pleasant. You know, it was a lot of fighting and yelling and things like that. <laughs> because he wouldn't be happy. And so he would attack his brother. Type <laughs> <laughs> so, but lately he's just really been into hiking and wanting to go. And so, yeah, they've been a lot more, well, and my eldest Samuel, he will go pretty much anywhere without complaint. If Sam ever complains about every, anything, there is something seriously wrong. Gotcha. So, and he really enjoys it going, especially with the adults. Cause a lot of the hikes that we do, the kids aren't on them quite as much. So it's usually a group of adults and Sam seem really seems to like that. Hang out with the big people. Now, when you go out, are you driving, you know, a big four wheeler pickup truck to a trailhead and then going in? Are you boondocking, you know, up, you know, getting past the trailhead with, with, with the vehicle? How are you beginning these hikes? And then how are you outfitted in terms of, accomplishing the hike but also getting your work done typically well depending on what road it is because a lot of the roads out here can be not not the greatest like last year we i took a group a lot of times i'll organize groups for women too and just throwing because a lot of times women want to get out but they don't feel comfortable either going on their own or even sometimes with mixed groups because just you know whatever they feel more comfortable with other ladies and so like last year, we, I organized one and it was a gal who was out from New York who was working on a project, an engineer. And I told her, I said, this road is rough. And so I had the, the four wheel drive truck and we just ground through that. And we got to the trailhead. I said, I bet you think we're all insane. And she's like, where I come from, we call these trails, not roads. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, some of the roads, you know, it, they can be rough. So I'll either drive the truck or we have a Toyota Highlander, which is an absolutely phenomenal little vehicle, too, that I love. I almost prefer the Highlander at times just because it's easier to maneuver. And I can see over the dashboard. I'm only five feet tall, so I can't oh. see over the dashboard. Oh boy. oh, boy. I know. So if you see me coming, just get out of the way. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. But yeah, so we it's typically day trips that will drive a couple of hours in either direction and park at the trailhead and hike anywhere from eight to no, eight to 13 miles and okay. then home. 
So now I'm going to, this is Howard Fox's opportunistic question again. What type of shape do you have to be in to go on some of these hikes with you? It depends. I do a lot of the hikes, which are geared towards families and kids. And so those are usually like five miles and less than a thousand feet elevation. And that's the thing. When I get, when people go with me with, you know, friends or whether it's kids or anything, I always want everybody to have a good time. So it can be challenging at one point, but my point is not to kill anybody who is coming with us. And so I always want to match that athletic level or that physical level with what we're going to do. And if something's too hard, I'll tell somebody. It's, you know, that I don't think this is the one for you. Now, if it's just us and, you know, with friends of mine, I have so many friends who are just phenomenal hikers and, you know, it's, you, you know, you'll, it's like 13, 14 miles, 3000 plus elevation gain, sometimes 4000 plus elevation gain. So, you know, they're, they're pretty good. They're, you, you have to be in pretty good shape, even though we go slow. I am I am not a fast hiker because I'm taking photos all the time. Sure, I sure I would be taking photos all the time too and I think I need to get in better shape before I say, "Okay, Amy, I'm going to be out here. What's the best time to come?" Well, so, yeah, I, come out, we have plenty of hikes to do. We got Okay, plenty. cool. Yep. Very cool. So, I don't think we can speak about Montana without talking about and you mentioned the word earlier, the apex predators, the 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 bears, the wolves, the coyotes, I, I guess I would still call them apex predators. What's your experience been with those lovely animals? Well, when I was working on the programs for National Geographic Television, pretty much specialized in grizzlies and mountain lions. And it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it really taught me a lot. It taught me not to fear either one of them, but to respect them both greatly. And it really opens your eyes to how they behave and how you're expected to behave. You know, it's it's funny. There was a video on Facebook and, and Instagram. It was one of those two. And, you know, the bear is, you know, walking down just by himself, herself down the road. And there's all these people off the road looking. And I'm thinking, man, I, was, I would not be outside of my car when there's a bear you know, one bear, let alone, I guess, in this particular story, about 70 bears over the course of this vacation holiday. But, you know, so you're you're learning not to fear the animals. I mean, certainly there's that respect. Any interesting experience, surpri surprising experience when it came to either the bears or the mountain lion that like, wow, that was an experience. Oh, oh, yeah. The, you know, probably the biggest one with the grizzlies was when the cameraman and I were up in British Columbia on a kokanee salmon stream. So the kokanee salmon are a landlocked salmon and they're smaller, turn bright red when they spawn. And so we knew the bears were there and we had built blinds up on the streams and we're hiking into one of the blinds for the evening because it was this female and two cubs that had been around quite a bit and wanted to get in the evening and hopefully catch her in the water below and that type of thing. So the plan was to hike in in the early afternoon. So we went bump into her going in at close, you know, at, towards the end, towards the dusk. And it was maybe a quarter mile from the truck. It wasn't very far. And you see two little heads pop up underneath this spruce tree and they took off and she came at both of us. And she just came so stinking fast. And I was just grateful that it was absolute instinct to pull out the bear spray and flip off the cap. And another fraction of the second, you know, would have hit that button. But she was being a good mother and put on the brakes and turned around and went after her cubs. So after, you know, after you could breathe, because everything stops. <laughs> but course. after you could breathe, you know, paced it off and she had stopped about 13 paces away. So, yeah, so abandoned that plan for the evening. But so that was very memorable. And it just really drove home how absolutely fast they are and how quickly something changes. That's and amazing. And you have to be ready. You yeah. Just, you have to know what you're going to do or think you know what you're going to do. And I was grateful that, well, I can't say that I thought about it, but I'm grateful that just instinct took over and I just did what I needed to do. Sure. Well, th those years of experience of just being outdoors, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, you know, it comes in handy. 
Now, early on, I had mentioned that I'd had these, this dream of being out in Montana, sleeping out underneath the stars. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, Amy, tell me about the, the stars and the Milky Way, just viewing the constellations. What's it like? Oh, it's gorgeous. I mean, we don't realize how blessed we are here in Montana until you travel a little bit, or even, I have to say, even being close to Great Falls or some of these bigger cities, and then being away from them, you realize how dark the skies can be. And, you know, I've been back in the Bob Marshall wilderness multiple times and, and cowboy camping like that, you know, where you, you're past the bug season, so you don't even need a tent. So you just throw the canvas mantee over your sleeping bag and everything. So it's just absolutely stunning to be able to sit there and you think you can count them all, but it's just absolutely immense. And, you know, of course, at certain times of the month, just absolutely so dark. It's it's amazing. People don't know dark until they come to some places here in Montana. All right. So that is definitely on my list. So we're going to have to have a conversation about this. Definitely. So. You have been involved with, obviously, n- numerous articles. I mean, we could go on and on with your writing, and but you have two books that you have been involved with. Can you share a little bit about those? Yes. The Nature Guide to Glacier and Waterton Lakes National Parks was published by Falcon this spring. It was May, June that it came out. It was supposed to be out last year, but of course, COVID held up everything. And that that's my baby so far. That was an absolute joy to write. I didn't take all of the photos. We did have to use some stock because like I told my editor, I said, I've spent 30 years in the park. I still don't have a full frame Wolverine, but it was still, it was so much fun. And I absolutely loved it and tickled to death with the response that I'm receiving from people. And then my second book, that I worked with a friend of mine, Michael Francis, who's a phenomenal photographer, and he's published dozens of books. It's called Yellowstone Found Photos. And it is based on photos that Mike has collected for 50 years. When he first visited the park just out of high school, I think it was, he started collecting postcards and then photo albums from visitors and from employees And he compiled thousands. And I think we ended up using about 400 for this book of historical photos from 1890s to 1940. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I worked with closely with Lee Whittlesey, who is the retired park historian. He was the park historian for 40 years, I believe. And he's a walking encyclopedia. And so I would research captions and send them to Lee and he would make corrections. And it was interesting because sometimes the information that I was finding on, you know, what seemed credible sites like National Park Service sites, he would go, no, no, no. And, you know, show me where this is actually inaccurate. So we were, did our absolute best to make sure all the information was accurate. Fantastic. Now for our listeners, Amy and I literally cross paths. I think it was last Friday where we're both members of the Outdoor Writers Association of America. And she had, on Fridays, we post some of our successes. And I think, Amy, that you posted about one of these, one of these books in commenting to the Friday post. How long have you been involved with the Outdoor Writers Association of America? Because great organization. It is. I was a member in the 90s originally when I was working in television. And then stepped away for probably close to a decade. And then I think I've been a member for seven, eight years again. It's just as my writing shifted from the gardening to more of the outdoor. So I basically say I went feral. (laughs) So when I went feral again, I decided I need to be more involved with the Outdoor Writers Association because, you know, they've just been a tremendous group and keep getting stronger. Most definitely. And it's been a pleasure to get to know the folks. And I joined it earlier in the year and just a great source of some phenomenal uh, guests on the podcast. So I have a question, Amy. Uh, As you look back in your career, is there anything that you would say to your younger self based on what you know now or advice that you would give her or, you know, or perhaps, you know, do exactly what you did? And so that would be part A, 
question 1A. So 1B might be, which the next 10, 15, 20 years look like for you? So either or, or both. Let's see. I would say for the part 1A, I don't think I would change anything. Even though I would I would go down one path and then you have to shift direction, you always learn something from that path. And so, no, I wouldn't have changed anything there. And we're the next 10, 15 years. I am really enjoying writing books. I, I love, I still absolutely love writing for magazines because it satisfies that instant need to get this information out. I just, I, I think I'm just geared towards wanting to teach people. And so if I get an idea, I really want to be able to share it immediately. So the magazines and the different and online publications help me do that. But I am really getting a kick out of writing these books and, and really, really want to have a lot more in the near future. Fantastic. Fantastic. So Amy, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, and by the way, knowing that I was going to have you on a podcast today, I have a friend, uh, Linda, who is a photographer. She's actually a a writer of sorts. She, uh, I guess there's a website called Medium. So she posts articles there. And I said, you need to check Amy out because I sent her a link to your YouTube and to the, to your website. So I don't know, you may have a stalker coming up, by the way. Uh, if she wants to hike, she can come visit. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where's the best places for them to go? Easiest place to see kind of what I've been up to lately is on my website, which is amygreesack.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Fair. I don't I don't tweet as much, but I'm definitely like Facebook and Instagram the best. Fantastic. I mean, I, I love both of those and uh, as well. And we'll definitely share the YouTube story, which I thought was fantastic. I mean, it was just great to get to know you that way as well. So Amy, once again, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series on Success Insight Podcast. And so glad you were open just based on that initial, hey, Amy, would you like to be on the podcast? I'm so glad you said yes. And you know, just really great getting to know you and your work. And I'm telling you, I'm an opportunistic guy. All my friends know that about me and I will get up to Montana and I definitely, perhaps even to uh, when there's a new moon and see that dark sky. Oh, absolutely. I have friends who have great telescopes. So definitely come on up and we'll show you the dark sky and, and go for a hike and anything you want. Fantastic. Thank you again. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the, uh, if you're able, at the annual conference in Vermont. Are you going to be there? I'm trying. I'm, I have a project that's going, well, it should be going full steam. The fires are messing me up. Ah. So it's going to see, I, it has to see how that pans out. All right. All right. I, I gotta tell you, it's getting from Las Vegas to Burlington, Vermont, and then to this uh, resort, it was not easy. So I can only imagine what it's like getting there from Montana. But it's going to be gorgeous. Yeah, I am so looking forward to it. I'm going to have my camera with me and uh, we'll see. Uh, my, I'm going to come back with some nice shots. So Absolutely. well, again, thank you so much and look forward to continuing to get to know you and learn more about you and your work. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, folks. We have just been chatting with Amy Griesack. She's a freelance writer, photographer. Her work is just phenomenal. Just the combination of the writing, the the adventures with the hiking, and really the whole idea of being in Montana, this wonderful place in the U.S., great outdoors, and just really appreciate everything we have to offer here in the U.S., Do check out her books, Nature Guide to Glacier and Waterton Lakes National Parks. That was released this past spring. And her newest book, which is going to be released shortly, Photos of Yellowstone, Yellowstone's History in Tourist and Employee Photos. And that's going to be available in paperback again this fall. You can learn more about Amy and her work by visiting her website at amygreesack.com, and we'll provide the backlinks there, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and do check out her story that appeared on YouTube. 
we'll provide that link as well as all the others as well. Folks, this has been, I don't know how you feel. I think it's been another fantastic episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series on the Success Insight Podcast. Do check us out on successinsightpodcast.com. We are on LinkedIn and Facebook on our Success Insight Podcast pages. As far as the podcasting platforms go, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the podcast players, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, especially Spotify, because we have our outdoor adventure series playlist. So many ways that you can consume this episode. And we'll, at least on our website, successinsightpodcast.com, we'll have some pictures of some of Amy's work for you to look at. And hopefully that'll pique your interest. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.